praying for them, and so we're grateful for their return. We continue to uh, keep our family of faith in prayer as we go into uh, the colder months. Uh, it's it's going to be more typical for us to keep those things in mind and checking in on each other. We're going to find ourselves in 1 Samuel 25 this morning. 1 Samuel 25. <clears throat> if, um, if, you, if you had a thorough Sunday school growing up, you might know the story. If you didn't have a thorough Sunday school growing up, which I wouldn't be surprised... Uh, they skipped this story. Um, if you grew up reading the King James, that's why they skipped the story. Uh, <laughs> uh, you'll notice, you'll notice uh, the King James translates uh, how David call, uh, talks about Nabal's men uh, a little bit differently than probably how we would say it today, uh, but that's all right. Uh, it still is ap- applicable there. We're going to look at this chapter, and I'm going to read through the whole chapter, all 44 verses. And then we'll pray, and we'll look at what God has for us here. 1 Samuel 25, Then Samuel died, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented with it for him, and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, And the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men. David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel. Go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him, who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shears. Your sheep were with you, and your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, And they will tell you, therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a feast day. Please give us whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away from uh, each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with his supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us. They did not hurt us, nor did we miss anything as long as, they, as we accompanied them. And when we were in the fields... They were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all of his household. For he is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. Or that one cannot speak to him, depending on your translation. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves of bread, two skins of wine, Four, five sheep already dressed, five seas of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisin, 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me. See, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under cover of the hill. And there David and his men coming down towards her, and she met them. Now David said, 
had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed at all that belongs to him, and he's repaid me evil for good. May God do also, uh, do so and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. That would have been one of the verses in the King James, if you're reading that uh, there. Uh, verse 23. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face from David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For his, his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord when they came, whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now be present... This present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seeks your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from a pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be of no grief to you, nor offense to the heart of my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would be left. To Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, and he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. And so it was in the morning when the wine had gone out from Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became like a stone. And it happened after about ten days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of, your repro of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant back from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail and she, to take her as his wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail and Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth and said, Here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the, feets, the feet of the servants of, your, of my Lord. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives, but Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galem. This is the word of the Lord. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that you would guide us into all truth that we might understand the principles that are here that can be applied to our lives, that we might live them out in obedience to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
the chapter is uh, quite segmented as we look at the beginning and kind of just announcing David dies and then we see uh, David and his conversation with Nabal and then we'll see a conversation uh, with Abigail and then the result from that. But I want us to look at two uh, themes that are, are seen through here. Both generosity and hospitality are seen throughout this chapter. So D Samuel dies, which is an era that has kind of been fading in the background. We haven't seen Samuel uh, really in a prominent position for a while. He got mentioned with David a little bit, uh, but he's kind of been in the background. And so Samuel is now gone. He's out of the story. We see a theme from Saul and David in the cave that Ken gave us last week that continues here with David and Nabal. And one of those themes is that we're to do to others as we would have them do unto us, right? And what does David do with Saul in the cave? He spares his life. Why? Because he wants his life spared. I shouldn't touch the, the life of the Lord's anointed. Saul and David are both anointed to the Lord, and David spares Saul's life, but Saul wants to kill David. And here, the narrative is really going to give us a picture for biblical generosity, generosity and hospitality. It seems very oddly placed, because we're going to see in the next chapter, in 26, it goes right back to Saul and David. Um, it's very odd that this just kind of drops right here in the middle. And so we see a continuation of, of this idea. So that this, this concept of generosity and hospitality, what is it? Why do we knew it? Why do we need it? And where do we get the power to do it? That's what we want to look at this morning. First of all, what is it? When we look at this passage, we really need to start by understanding Middle Eastern culture. And, and maybe you're familiar with that, and maybe you're not, but if and if you were with Middle Eastern people, uh, we live in a city that has Middle Eastern people, so maybe you have friends or neighbors that are like this. Uh, it's culturally mandated. It is, it is a positive peer pressure on them to be hospitable. I remember uh, when Sarah and I uh, were both working in a church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we would go door knocking and knock on people's doors. It was very common for them to invite you into their home. Not because that's an American custom. It's not. I promise you, if somebody knocks on your door this week, that is not your custom to invite them into your home and give them coffee. <laughs> Maybe if you're trying to convert them to Jesus, but you do not want to hear their sales pitch. You don't care about Time Warner Cable. You don't, <laughs> you don't care about the new rates the Spectrum has. You are a busy person. Sorry, I don't have time to talk to you. Close the door. That's not the Middle East. The Middle East says, no, come, invade my life interrupt my day, why don't I make you tea and coffee? You know, would you like some cookies? That's what I have. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about your life. So David here has protected Nabal's shepherds. He's provided safety for them. And he asked for hospitality in return. Notice what the servant said. It's a feast day. Nabal, can, can we have some of your feast? Would you please share with us? We've done you a service. Would you please share with us? And yet, as we see Nabal's response, is one of scorn. Uh, hospitality here is not something that he wants to do. And, and in, in our culture today, as, as we uh, look around, I mean, hospitality might be a little bit more common in uh, some of the rural areas, right? Um, we are probably more hospitable than some people uh, on the East Coast, if you've been in New England or New York City or D.C., they're just not as uh, warm and loving all the time. Uh, but, but we still have some of the remnants of the Midwest hospitality uh, that are in pockets around us. But, but Christ's followers are supposed to be marked by this hospitality. And so David comes to Nabal. He's expecting that he's going to follow this common practice Within Israel, and Nabal's response rather is that he's arrogant and he's insulting. He clearly has no intent of being gracious or hospitable to him. He has no intent of providing a meal. Uh, hospitality and generosity are inconvenient to him. 
and he shows that any gratitude that he might give to David is scoffable. Notice what he says there. <laughs> His response is, who is David? Who's the son of Jesse? You know, there's a lot of slaves that are running away from their masters today. Who's to say he's not one of them? David's known by thousands, remember? Saul sung his, by his praises by thousands, David his ten thousands. David's a household name. Nabal's not claiming ignorance. He's claiming arrogance. I don't care who David is. I don't care who your master is. I have no responsibility to share my things with him. He even likens David running from Saul to a slave running from his master. We, we're familiar with that in the New Testament with Onesimus and Philemon. But slaves running from their master got put to death. Uh, that's, that's not what's going on here with David and Saul. He doesn't care that any good's been shown to his men. He, sh he selfishly says, I've worked hard for what I have. <laughs> right? What, what does he say in verse 11? Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to men when I, I don't even know where they're from? <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> these vagabonds that are just wandering through the wilderness. He's very selfish. I, I don't even know you from Adam. Now, th does that sound like something maybe you've said before? Does that sound like something you've thought in your heart? Maybe it's not something we say outright. Maybe you said something like, well, here, I don't need this anymore, so you can at least have that. Or, well, we're not using this anymore, so I suppose you could have that, right? That's not generosity. That's not hospitality. That's, that's like giving the scraps to the dog. We get mad every time Mozzie steals food off of Micah's plate. They're down on the same level. And Mozzie's just like, free pickings. No, the scraps are for you, dog. Not the main meal. There's nothing noble or generous about giving what you don't use or you don't need anymore. Do we actually believe that God will provide all of our needs according to His riches and grace in Christ Jesus? Do we actually believe that principle? Because if we do, we can share radically. We can share generously. We can be hospitable like this. But if we don't, then yes, we'll have the same attitude that Nabal has. I've worked for what's mine. How dare you try to take it? You say, well, what, what, what is this supposed to look like? Generosity is not just money. Generosity is your time. It's your attention. It's your love. It's your care. It's your resources. It's your home. It's your life. It's opening up your life, your schedule, to another life and saying, yes, you're allowed to be part of it for a while. You say, well, pastor, we're busy. Yes, I know. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> we're all busy. We live in a rat race life. And yet we're all as busy as we want to be. Notice when Jesus is in his ministry, he's just as busy as any of us. And yet, what does he do time and again? He stops on his way to go do other things to help the people along the way. He stops to heal. He stops to have conversations. He forgives sins and he heals them along the way to doing other things. He's giving his time, his healing, his attention. He's healing, his, he's giving his care, his forgiveness, his love. He's giving his virtue. All those things are flowing out of him all the time. He goes on to a boat because he's exhausted. He takes a nap. And even there the disciples need him. 
So if we're to be a people who are changed and marked by Christ, we need to be imitators of God in our generosity. And what I'm concerned is, is that oftentimes, because we live in a culture that doesn't express it as mandatory, and because therefore we can feel pretty good about ourselves if we do it occasionally, is that this is our mindset. We sound like Nabal in our hearts a lot of times. That I don't know who you are, I don't care where you're from, and I don't have time for you. Therefore, my resources are for me. David's kindness is spurned. Nabal's rudeness is reported back to David. So that's, that's what we're looking at. Why do we need this? Well, the second thing that we need to understand is that even in a culture where hospitality may be customary, there's still something within every human heart that says, this is mine. I don't have to share. This is mine. I worked hard for this. I've been saving for months. This has been a dream of mine for years. I need this. What happens when the men report back to David? Verse 12. They come and told him they came and told him all these words. And David said to his men, every man gird on his sword. And they're out for blood. Now, that might seem to you as a very harsh reaction. Uh, Nobody set siege to your house because you didn't want to upgrade your gas plan. You know, (laughs) nobody set a police barricade around your house because, listen, I'm really not interested in what you have to sell today. Okay, nobody's done that. That might seem a little extreme. David, you're just flying off the handle here, grabbing swords and going. But no matter how nice of a person you are or how much pressure society might push on you, generosity and hospitality are primarily a matter of the heart. It's not just the outward. Nabal's revealing his heart here. Uh, David's response is to take vengeance, and Nabal compared him to a runaway slave, treating him as if he's a nobody running from Saul, right? Uh, David swears that Nabal won't have a single man standing by morning light. If you look at the old king, it's he won't have a single man peeing against a wall. Nobody will be. They'll be all wiped out. The servants come to Abigail and tell her what happened. Notice uh, verse 15. Listen, the men were really good to us. We were not hurt. They were like a wall around us. They provided protection and safety. They were amazing. We loved having them around. We didn't lose a single sheep. We didn't have to worry about predators or invading armies. There were no marauders trying to steal or, or, or anything like that. And so what do they say? Listen. Our master reviled them, and you need to take heed to what you're going to do about it. Because harm is determined against our master and against his household. He deserves what's coming to him, right? Nabal's a fool who doesn't listen to anyone. And there's certainly trouble coming for us now, ma'am. That's, that's the report back to Abigail. Now, what would you expect the woman of the house to do in this situation? What would you expect Abigail's response to be? All the workers around the farm know Nabal's horrible. Abigail herself knows that her husband's a fool who's stubborn and bullheaded. He's arrogant and stuck in his ways. You could easily say he deserves what's coming. You could, you could easily say, you know, if you went and asked five of your neighbors this afternoon, right? I know it's a little bit chilly, but let's just say you're out walking the dog or, or chatting with them. Ask your neighbors. Just tell them the rough sketch of what's going on here. I promise you, you're going to have neighbors that say, he deserves to die. <laughs> you're going to have other neighbors that are like, well, you know, I mean, maybe you could just overlook it this once. And they're going to have other neighbors that are wondering you know, maybe we should be nice. Like, like, you know, maybe we should actually be nice here and just, just forgive Nabal. Maybe he was just having a bad day. 
You, you might even have a neighbor that agrees with David <laughs> uh, and says, yes, take swords and let's go take the house out. Uh, but the response we see from Abigail isn't to preserve Nabal. We're going to see that in her speech to David. Her response to David coming is to preserve David. Her response specifically is that she wants to preserve David's reputation. We're going to see that in her speech. She loves God. That's her heart. And so generosity naturally flows from her heart. That's the greatest commandment from Jesus. That we are to love God with every part of our being, but if we're honest, none of us can really see that relationship. We just talked about that with church discipline in Sunday school. It's really hard to see your relationship with God. So what's the tangible way that you see that? By loving your neighbor. And if you're not loving your neighbor, if you're not doing those things, then we're really going to be concerned about your relationship with God. I don't think you'll love God if you're not loving your neighbor. Abigail loves God, and therefore she loves her neighbor David and cares about his reputation. She generously packs uh, this Thanksgiving dinner and a couple picnic baskets and runs to meet David. Her introductory speech is incredible. If you look at it, she just immediately dismounts. Verse 24, she says, On me, O Lord, on me, let this iniquity be on me. Please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. She took it seriously. David's ready for blood. So please (laughs) hear me out first. Please hear me out. I know that the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and avenging yourself with your own hand. And let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. What does she point out? First of all, she takes blame. She dismisses her husband as stupid. He's a fool. Nobody cares about him. Ladies, I'm not saying this is your model speech. (laughs) um, But you probably could all give examples of where the husbands are clueless. Sarah could take the rest of the morning doing that for us. Uh, we, we know this truth. Uh, but, but she says, listen, uh, Nabal's stupid. It's, it's in his name. And uh, listen, I didn't see your young men come. She takes this and she shifts the blame to herself. Notice verse 26, she says, I'm an instrument of God's protection of David and thwarting his mission. In verse 26, the Lord has held you back. Well, how has the Lord held, her, held him back? By sending Abigail. By sending Abigail to, to thwart this mission. She places all of the responsibility on herself and begs for mercy. Notice verse 28. What does she say? Please forgive the trespasses of Nabal. No, it's please forgive the trespasses of your maidservant. Or some of your uh, versions are going to just say, your servant. But it's specifically hers. She's taking the guilt of this. She's taking this on herself. She's not claiming it to be just Nabal being a fool, but rather it's her offense. She also recognizes that David is protected by the Lord. And Nabal might have pretended not to know who David was, but Abigail knows the Lord is going to make a lasting dynasty out of David. God is protecting you. And she alludes, you see this in verse 29, she alludes to God protecting him and that God is using a sling, right? Going back to David and Goliath. But she also says that she doesn't want David to have a troubled conscience. What? For needlessly fighting Nabal. Right? Verse 30, when you come to power... When the Lord uh, appoints you ruler over Israel, verse 31, that this will be of no grief to you. There's no offense of the heart of my Lord. She's worried that down the road, David's going to look back and be like, why did I do that? I didn't need to kill him. God would have still brought you into power without that ever happening. And then she asks David to be generous with the good things that the Lord does for him and remember her. 
which seems odd right now, but we're going to see that pan out. David rejoices in God sending Abigail and, and stopping him and receives the food and calls off the mission. And what do we see? Abigail returns in verse 36 to Nabal. He's holding a feast like a king. His heart's merry and he's drunk, and so she waits until morning light. It's really interesting that they use that there, because by morning light the house would have been dead. If Abigail hadn't gone out, the house would have been wiped out. And so she returns. <laughs> Nabal's oblivious to the mortal danger that he was about to encounter if Abigail hadn't intervened. In verse 37, when it's morning, everybody uh, hears about this. Abigail shares the news, and Nabal has a seizure, uh, most likely. He has a seizure of some nature. He's paralyzed. Ten days later, the Lord takes his life. And we see in verse 39, David hears and he blesses the Lord. Why? The Lord has taken out vengeance again. God has continually been on David's side and he once again carries out vengeance on David's behalf. <clears throat> so then David does the cultural practice, asks Abigail to marry him, and uh, that then means he gains Nabal's estate. She humbly accepts and then offers to simply be the feet-washing slave. To go from a woman of power with Nabal, who's this very wealthy man, feasting like a king, to go from that to being the feet-washing slave. That's the bottom of the slaves, guys. That's, that's the newbie that just got off the slave boat. That hasn't worked here very long. It hasn't gotten up into power at all. Like, the feet-washing slave is despicable. But that's her humility here. She comes and she accepts the position. And we finish out the chapter uh, with some details there about David's spouses and Saul giving away Michael. Where, where do we get the power then to do this? Where do we get the power to do this hospitality and generosity thing that we see exemplified here? And to sum up the chapter, <clears throat> if we were to use this principle of do unto others as you would have them do unto you at kind of a street level, David has treated Nabal graciously. He's treated him generously. Nabal's mocked and slandered David. David is ready to wipe out Nabal, and Abigail steps in. Abigail secures safety for her family and peace with God, or peace with David, rather. Uh, but if, if we look at that motif, right, David does good, Nabal does evil, David's ready to wipe out Nabal, Abigail steps in, preserves her family, and secures peace with David. It's the same motif that you see with Moses in Exodus 32. If you want to move there in your Bibles, Exodus 32, G, uh, Moses is up on Mount Sinai with the Lord. In Exodus 32, he is receiving the tablets from the Lord. And he's been up there a while. The people grow tired of waiting. And so they come to Aaron. Aaron takes their earrings and throws them into a fire and a fatted calf walks out, right? Let's look at verse 6 through 14. Exodus 32. Verse 6 is, when they rose early on the next day, they, burned, burn, they offered burnt offerings and uh, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. Sounds a lot like Nabal feasting like a king. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I've commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Sounds kind of like Nabal. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. Sounds like David with swords. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, 
and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Right? The Lord said, no, these are your people, Moses. You brought them out. And Moses says, no, Lord, they're your people and you've brought them out. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them in? out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. All this land I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Sounds like the conversation Abigail had with David. Lord, this isn't what you brought your people out to do. And Moses doesn't say this, but Abigail does. You're going to regret this down the road, David, because this isn't the mission that God's called you to do. The people are stubborn, they're stiff-necked, they've forsaken the covenant that they just made with God in the previous chapters, and they're worshiping the idols, saying the idol delivered them uh, instead of God from Egypt. And God wants to wipe out Moses' people. Moses steps in and secures safety for his family, Israel, and peace with God. That's exactly what we see Jesus do. Hebrews 8, 5, and 6 tells us that. That these previous people, they serve as a copy and a shadow of heavenly things as Moses is divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he also is a mediator of a better covenant. And which was established on better promises. Jesus is the better mediator, it's a better covenant, and is based on better promises. And that's what we have today. Where do we get the power to be hospitable and generous with the things that God has entrusted to us as stewards? Where do we get the ability to do this? Where do we have the ability to stand as Christ's ambassadors to a fallen and wicked world? Because Christ has mediated a better covenant and it's established on better promises. That's why. And He lives within us. He gives us the power to obey His commands. And we just have to obey them. So what are some of the takeaways? First of all, are you busy like Nabal? Getting what's yours in this life? Are you working hard to afford the things that you want so that you're not generous with those same things? Have we forgotten that every good gift comes from the Father And we are just stewards of it for a time. That's what the Psalm 49 pointed out. Do do you love God with all of your being? Is He the master of every part of your life? But we won't generously love our neighbors? Hmm? Do we truly love God with all of our life if we're not showing that love to our neighbors? If I love God, but I'm also chasing some of my dreams, I can't be generous because it would ruin my dreams. Do you have aspirations for yourself? Maybe for your family, your kids, your grandkids that restrict you from sharing God's resources with the people around you, with your neighbors. Ken just reminded us of this passage in Philippians last week. Jesus left behind all the glories of heaven to come and generously give us a free salvation that's completely paid for by Him. 
how can we not give also generously to all those around us? And and how can we hold on to the temporary dreams of this life and not wholeheartedly give ourselves to what he's commanded us to do? Father, we are grateful that you have given us the power to obey your word. And now help us to do it, that we need to just obey. Pray that you do that with our time, with our resources, with our lives, with our schedule even as we've prayed for gospel conversations to happen this week. I pray that you'd give each one here opportunities to share the gospel this week with someone and that they would, in bold obedience to your spirit, do that, even if it interrupts their life that we might generously give the gospel, that we might generously give of the things that you've given to us as gifts to steward in your power and for your glory.